teacher certification program as a math major, a lot like our program here, and I taught high school for eight years before I went back and earned a PhD in mathematics proper. So my plan had eventually been actually been to get the PhD and learn math because it amuses me, and then go back into the high school classroom. But uh, I mean, if you get that into math, you don't want to stop and just go back to where you were. So my, my interest in terms of teaching tends to be, I mean, teaching at the undergraduate level, I very much enjoy teaching mathematics. But in terms of education, outside of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, my main interest is in K-12 education, in particular, teachers' understanding of mathematics and policies in our public schools in the United States is going to be my main interest. And my work here is with the teacher certification program. Um, but as the only math ed person here, and as someone who has some experience, I have read research in math education also, and I do have some, in, some knowledge of um, broader issues, but my main focus is on K-12 education and helping develop secondary school teachers, and then teaching mathematics and continuing to think about mathematics myself. Um, and then I'm going to take the opportunity, since someone gave me a room full of undergraduates, to talk a little bit about our program, because some of you don't know anything about it, or know a little about it, um, so our teacher preparation program, the first option is for an undergrad math major where you'll also get certified to teach. And it's a slightly, slightly lighter major in the sense that it has maybe one or two fewer electives. And the other electives aren't really electives. You have to take probability, algebra, analysis, geometry, math history, um, I think that's, and, and, a, and a math course focusing on the secondary degree. So your electives are locked in and there are fewer of them. But you have an undergraduate degree in mathematics, a very good undergraduate degree in mathematics, and you also get certified to teach. Um, the second one is for people who, who got a, a bachelor's degree in mathematics, no education experience, no teaching courses here or somewhere else, and there's a two-year program to get certified in teaching mathematics. Some people want to start as undergraduates, they're planning to do this. Some people start doing mathematics because they enjoy mathematics, and when they finish, they think maybe they're interested in teaching. We also get people applying to the program from that path. And the last one, which is really the one I wanted to share with this group, because I'm guessing it's um, strong undergraduates, who are maybe doing a little bit more than you're required to do, being here at 7 o'clock tonight, being one example. Um, so this is, you're doing a regular Bachelor of Science in Mathematics, where the only difference is, I think, some of your electives are fixed because you have to take certain courses. And maybe one less analysis class, just because we didn't want to remove another elective and replace it with analysis class, so we left another course open as an elective. Um, but other than that, it, it's just a, it's, it's a very strong mathematics undergraduate preparation, and some students do take more than the requirement for in this program. And the Master of Arts in Teaching combined in a five-year program. I mention this here because I know we have undergraduates who get into taking maybe some doctoral level courses while they're here. And if, you're, if you think you might be interested in teaching, you might want to think about doing this also while you're here, if you're already far enough in advance that you're going to maybe extend for a year to do more mathematics, or realizing you're going to finish the mathematics quickly and you want to stay to explore other options. Don't do it if you have zero interest in ever working with young people. If you don't want to teach adolescents, don't do this. But if you think you might, it might be something you want to do, it's worth it because with this degree and taking some extra classes, you could be prepared to teach secondary school, secondary school, teach at a community college if you want to do that. We have a few graduates who are in community colleges or in small, um, not master's degree granting institutions, but smaller colleges. Um, or even going to graduate school, we've had some students go on. One is, I think, doing a doctoral program at Allen CUNY. Um, another one did a, a master's and maybe doctoral program at AMS. I don't remember whether he continued on. So this prepares you to do lots of things in addition to possibly teaching in a public school, if you think you like it. It's not a fallback um, job if you keep working with, working with kids all day. So it's only something you, you can actually be interested in doing. Um, so what I picked, so I got an email saying, do you want to talk about math education? And this is the part that I really am very, very heavily involved in. Um, I picked this topic for a couple of reasons. One, I had mentioned it briefly in, in another talk, and I thought I should read it more closely, this Instructional Practices Guide, Practices Guide, and I think Professor Chas has, has looked at this, and probably no other faculty here have looked closely at this, recommendations from the MAA on what we should be doing in, in our classrooms for, that you're sitting in, what we should be doing as instructors for, for undergraduates. 
Now it's free, and it might stop being free at some point, so you should click it and take a copy if you have any interest in ever maybe going to graduate school, maybe teaching at a college or a university or a community college. Familiarizing yourself with this will make you potentially a better teacher and potentially more likely to get a job where you're in a classroom if you know some of the things presented here. I mean, they're separated basically into instructional practices, which is what we usually think of when we think about teaching, and assessment practices, which I think some people focus on a little bit less. I didn't learn to think carefully about assessment until I was actually a TA in grad school. I didn't think as carefully about it as I should have when I was actually teaching public school, I think and design practices with actually planning and planning your course. So I'll talk a little bit about these, each of these. I'll talk a little bit about some of the MAA recommendations. This is, I'm barely scratching the surface just to give you an idea of what's in here. This is a very rich document, it's worth looking at. And I'll tell you a little bit of what they do and I'll tell you, I'll make some connections to some of the things that I know something about. I, I forgot the disclaimer. What I wanted to say is, I care very much about mathematics education. My main focus is K-12 education. I think there's things that I do well here as an instructor. I think I, I do some things well that other instructors don't do well, and I think I feel fill a hole here. But I don't make any claim to be an expert in teaching mathematics because I think there's lots of other faculty members here who fill different holes, who I know do things very well that I don't do well. So you want to get what you can from me, but get what you, what you can from anybody else whose classroom you're sitting in or who you happen to talk to while you're here, including this guy in the back who's been teaching some part once. So instructional practice, they focus on two uh, main issues. One is fostering student engagement, which is something that I try to do in the classroom, and the other is selecting appropriate mathematical tasks, which is difficult, and which I try to get some of my students to do for K-12. Um, I forgot to add to this talk. Our, our teachers aren't so good at, at doing this, it turns out. In fact, I remember I'll come back to some examples here, but I don't have any in the talk. For now, I'm just going to talk about fostering student engagement. So one practice that's mentioned in the MAA guide that I also like to think about is, is wait time. It's defined in different ways. It can be the time between I ask a question and how long do I give a student to answer. It can be defined how long between I talk and I talk again. It can be how long I wait between a student talking and me talking or between a student and, a, and another student responding. They're pretty much focusing in this book on probably how long in this guide between my talking and how long do I give you before you give an answer to something. And so different research studies say that you know, the average wait time is, is fewer than three seconds. That you'll have an um, and studies show that a, if you use a, high, a longer wait time, <coughs> and I think longer is maybe five seconds, that student achievement improves, measurable. And another, another research study, and I think this one is from the 80s, points out that um, women and men are not always given the same wait time. Men are sometimes given more time to answer than, than women. So there's things to talk, think about if you're teaching, or to observe if you're in a classroom. And it's not just male teachers that favor male students. It's female teachers that also, for some reason, in the classroom I think, tend to favor male students. Um, so, what, what I do in my class for wait time, I, I, I'm pretty good about waiting mainly because I'm actually very shy and very nervous and I don't enjoy standing in front of a group of people just talking. So the sooner I get students talking, the more relaxed I feel in the classroom and the better teacher I am. So for that reason, I'm better at wait time because I want to hear what the students have to say and my own confidence issues. Um, but sometimes I'll ask a question and the students really aren't answering and they're not waiting. I mean, they're not they're not answering and they, they want me to talk and I'm trying not to get them to an answer. And in that case, I'll just stop and count to myself as high as 30, very slowly. So really 30 seconds. And by the time I get to 27, usually someone answers. Um, maybe once or twice, I'll get to 30 and no one answers and finally you know, I'll ask another question and I'll log in. But if you stop and just wait a few seconds, and it feels like a long time if you look at the clock and stop. So it was somewhere between five and seven seconds, I couldn't see the second. And it feels like a long period of quiet in the classroom. But if, you're, if you actually give wait time, it means that your questions, it means to students that your questions are something to think about. 
They're not a quiz. They're not like, I want to know the answer right away. They're actually, you're actually asking the students to stop and think deeply about mathematics, which is another reason I think this is um, an important, it's a very powerful tool that improves your instruction with very little effort. Um, Inquiry-based learning is, is in terminology that means, that means what it says. Students are asking questions. Students are making conjectures. Students are proving their own conjectures. This is how I think of it. So according to the MAA, it should be characterized at least, there's more in there, um, by deep engagement, meaning in the classroom. Students are doing mathematics in the classroom. They're not saying that I should never be lecturing in a class, but I shouldn't be just lecturing. There should be lots of opportunities where students are thinking on their own, asking questions on their own, looking for patterns on their own, making conjectures and trying to prove them on their own in the classroom or with each other, I mean without me. Peer-to-peer um, -peer instruction, I, don't, I think it's important, I think it's good. I wouldn't personally put it as, call it a requirement for inquiry-based learning, but the NAA does. There needs to be some peer interaction in order to call it inquiry-based learning. And deliberately, deliberate use of student reasoning and instruction. Um, it's not always easy to do. It's easy to do for me because it interests me and I want to pursue students' ideas when I ask a question. Um, but sometimes you'll have in mind three directions where the students might go and they might go somewhere else. They might go somewhere else that has nothing to do with what you're doing but it's still very interesting and a very good mathematical path to follow and you'll want to follow it. And I have t courses I teach where I, I'm free to do that but there's also courses where you're not free to do it because you have the syllabus and you're supposed to cover A, B, and C. So it's a little bit challenging to Create an environment where you deliberately use student reasoning, but then sometimes silence the students and say, no, no, that's wrong. So we're going to do this way instead. So, um, but it should be part of it. It's, it so, so MIA says that this is part of inquiry-based learning, is that, and this makes sense. If you don't actually use students' ideas, students' creative ideas are not going to believe that they're really searching for the answer at all. They're going to believe they're looking for what you wanted them to say next. So you really do want to use their ideas in a classroom. Um, flipped classroom. Raise your hand if you've heard this term before. Okay, put your hand down. Raise your hand if there's a mathematics teacher here who's using a flipped classroom. Okay. So where, where have you heard the term and who's using it? Uh, no, I've heard the term uh, okay. not from my test, but uh, just that I've heard it. I guess online. Um, and Moira Chast is the one who would do that. So what's her setup for the flipped classroom? Um, sometimes she would tell us to um, walk around and talk to each other about so what our ideas are. Where does the flipping part come in? Um, well, well it's not it's now that the students are doing the Okay. 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 So, so I, the reason I ask is because most people, at least young mathematicians who I interact with at meetings who are working on teaching type things, they'll, they'll think of a flipped classroom as being exactly one thing. The students go home and do something on the video. They watch, they watch you a pre-recorded video or they watch some other video you, you've arranged. They watch something at home. And then they come in and work together, as you just described. So they're working on the, on, the, on the work together. So more generally, you could think of, usually you think of, there's the group space mathematics where they might have an, um, I want to think of, I, want to, I think I just want something. Yeah, it might usually be the case that you work together in class first, usually with instructor lecture, and then you go home and you work on your own. Whereas the flipping should really be the individual space means you try it home first, and then we work together in the group space after. But it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a video that you go home and watch it. I don't know why the terminology is attached to that. You, you go home and watch a video and then you get together and, and work together in class on the video. So that's one. I have, I have a colleague who's, who's, a, who's a new assistant professor who spent like almost her first year just, just huge, huge amounts of time preparing the video, which was much more time than she would put into actually teaching. So it basically seemed like it was way, 
way, way too much extra work on a first year instructor to plan something like this. When there's other ways in my mind that you could have the, the instructional benefit of, of flipping something. So my experience of, of doing this was when I was teaching high school. This is interactive mathematics program. My inter interactive mathematics project, I think the P stands for program, was a nice curriculum. Um, where the whole, the whole series was that the students do the problem first at home, you assign them a single problem for homework, and they're supposed to explore and figure out how to do it. And then in class, they present their solutions, and then together you go on and generalize the next mathematical idea from their work, and then you give them your net. And there's, there's another in-class activity together, and then they go home and do another single exploring problem at home that they were supposed to connect to the, to the next class. So every day was pretty much playing where the students do the initial work themselves. It's a really, really nice program. I enjoyed working with it. It was very challenging to get students, and teachers really, but to get students comfortable with that. Because many students are used to, not this class, anyone who's into their math major, which we just jump on this and be fine. But in public school, you've got this diverse group of kids, many of them are just coming in, taking notes and going home. It's not so easy, and similarly in the university, in classes that aren't necessarily just math majors, it's not so easy to get students comfortable with, go figure it out on your own, try whatever you can, and then we'll talk about it. So, um, but, but the mathematical discussions are much richer. Not always, but in general, you get much more mathematics done. The students learn more. It feels like it can be, it can feel like it's going slower in terms of covering the curriculum. But the students get much more into it. So are there other questions on that or on any, anything else? Okay, so the second piece has to do with assessment, which, again, I don't think it's something that I did as well um, when I was teaching high school. I don't think I got as much background into thinking carefully about assessment until I was a TA when I was at an institution that, that cared about teaching. Um, it's not the same as a grade. So, so yes, you, you might use an assessment to assign, you might use an assessment to assign a grade in the class, but that's not all assessment should be. It should be constantly trying to figure out what your students know, what they don't know, and basing your continual planning off of what they know and what they don't know. Um, so this is just terminology if you go off the vocabulary to go with it. Formative assessment generally means assessments that you're doing along the way. And uh, summative assessment generally means at the very end, what, what can the students really do with the end? of the unit or the, or the chapter or the week or whatever. So some, some light examples of formative assessments, just asking questions in class, real questions that you want students to stop and think about and give you their answer to. Um, this right question mark is what you'll see younger teachers doing, is they'll say, so, you know, so five over ten, that's one over half, right? And just keep going, and they'll do lots and lots of rights. Because they feel like they should be asking, and they feel like they should be interacting with the class. But they're not, and showing in lots of rights, rights, is not asking a real question. Even saying, do you have any questions, is not asking a real question. Because most students aren't so comfortable answering. Or do you understand, is not enough. But asking real questions to find out what the students know is a real form of assessment. A short quiz is a real form of assessment. Exit ticket is something I don't use, but lots of public school teachers use it, and it's kind of a, another piece of terminology. Does anyone know what an exit ticket is? Um, where do you do from high school or from the university? In high school. What is your goal to the course of the exit ticket? Like, maybe in social studies class, you have a lesson, and then at the end of it, you have to uh, set your foot on, on a piece of paper and answer it specific question. Yeah, you can ask students to summarize what you did or ask a specific question or even conjecture on what might come next. Conjecture on, on an extension of what you did. Teachers oh, yeah. like this, I don't use it so much. Um, class notes, that's something I do in my, one of my math content courses for teachers. Um, where I have, it's a small class and they do it students. And so each student twice during the semester has to write up the whole notes of what we did in class that day. Part of it's because the class is a discussion and we're bouncing around. It's nice to have a student come together in one presentation. And part of it originally when I started doing this was learning how to write mathematics, helps you to learn mathematics. And so when I initially assigned it was I wanted students to have a 
couple of experiences and writing very carefully and in detail. But what it also tends to be when I do it properly and, and keep up on grading is a very good assessment of what the students are gaining from a lecture. It's phenomenal to, to, to have a lecture and have a conversation and to think you're talking about the same thing and then to read what a student wrote about it and to see how a particular concept could have been completely misunderstood or you said something and you see why, how you phrased it caused the student to be mis it caused the misunderstanding. So for me, the class notes, for my students, it's something they don't enjoy doing, but for me, it really does give insight into what they've gotten out of the lecture, out of the discussion. It's very useful. Um, and they do like it at the end when they get to see other people's notes, to, to review, for example, and see how other students present their thing. Um, another type of formative assessment that I really like, that I used at Arizona, was originally designed by a physics professor at Harvard who was working with huge lectures. Imagine like a big calculus lecture, and he wanted the students to be involved and talk to each other. Um, but you can't really just have all the students in an auditorium get into groups and chat for a while because it's going to be total chaos in your room. And so what he what he uses are these short, non-computational, multiple choice, true, false questions. And it takes work to write some of these that assess conceptual understanding. It's not can you compute this, but do you, do you understand the basic ideas here? And they also promote student-student interaction. So the way, the way they work is you present the question, and you have the students work alone, and then vote on the solution. And then you have them talk to each other, and you, and you project the, the votes if you're in a large classroom, which is how you know if you're in a small classroom. Um, and then you have them talk to each other and vote again, and hopefully, um, hopefully fix their misconceptions. So I'm trying to decide which one I should have. But Matthew's taking right now. Five classes? Yeah. Oh, uh, three point two. That's multi-dimensional analysis, and that's uh, for two. Okay. Okay. So here's one. I'll start with this question. So here's an example. So, so by yourself, decide your solution. This might be too easy. It was not too easy for my three minutes. Take a look at it. Decide. Wait, don't, don't, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you, are you wanting to tell me the answer or answer? Answer. Answer. Okay. We'll go ahead, don't, we'll, we'll go. So, so, by the way, with that, if you do this in a large classroom, the idea is you're using clickers so students aren't like pressured to like be embarrassed or like look at the, whoever the, the smart kid is and guess what they're going to say. So if you have to close your eyes, close your eyes. It's not a big deal. Maybe you should just say, please close your eyes and we'll see. Um, raise your hand if you vote true. So you need to talk to each other, and I'll wait a good two minutes to see. This is when you want to get all true or all false. So stop and talk to people, not to me, and try to just try to make your argument. I don't understand what any of this one is. I kind of guess. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, and then here's, I might have given you guys this one. This, this is my favorite one to use when I start teaching probability with, with the, the, the class of teachers. So they've seen probability before. So we're revisiting it and talking about it at, at, the, at their level and at the high school level. They've seen it before. And this is the question I like to give. So, so, okay, so without talking, just bridge, I'm going to wait 15 more seconds. I wasn't sure if you were done or not. to show you the game, but let's just finish it. Let's, what, can someone explain the, an argument? Whether you picked A or C, is anyone willing to? Yeah. Since there's there's four tiles, so you, there's a 50% chance you pick the blue tile. Since you're, you're choosing two and four, it's going to be This is an example of you saying same thing. Go ahead and start again. Okay, so there's a 50% chance you choose a blue tile in one of the two draws. And uh, there's a 50% chance you don't, which means you have two of uh, the red. I don't. I don't see how you see maybe you know, there's a fifty percent chance of drawing a blue and two draws. at the same time? Yeah, That's I think it matters. Yeah. Same time or does it matter? I don't know. I think after another. Same time, one after another, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Without replacer, nothing. You're not throwing anything back in that. Oh, it's just the geometric data, of course. What were you going to say about how to do it? You just. But this is a good question because I only had maybe one class of teaching this, using this problem again and again because I love it that, 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 that gets it right the first time. And then, then it does really motivate the, the class. Okay, so, so I really like concept tests a lot and um, putting one or two into your class a couple of times during the semester is just one more way to get the students involved. So summative assessments. So it could, so just a little bit. So you, you already think of a summative assessment as being what we do all the time, which is take an exam at the end of the, at the end of the year. So what was the answer? Neither. Neither. Yeah. Yeah. So so we could get you could get red one with red two, red one with red three, red two with red three, and you could get blue with red one, blue with red two, or blue with red three. You do the right. Right, so written exam, but one of the things that I didn't do initially but I learned about later was that you should, you know, include lots of different representations of the concepts you want to test. So some things you want to test verbally, which I do a lot for the pre-service teachers because I want to know if they can explain or articulate their understanding of something and test something graphically, test something numerically, and something but not the entire exam should be symbolic understanding. And usually it's at least 90% of the exam. And sometimes it's nice to um, teach something in one way and test it in another. Another way that you, you've solved problems graphically, but maybe not this particular concept. So teach something symbolically, ask them if they can figure it out graphically, teach something graphically and ask if they can you know, explain it verbally. And this is a, this is a very simple. This shouldn't just be for the assessment. This should be while you're teaching also. You should try to see things of various representations. If I'm ever sentenced to teach to coordinate calculus, the exam will do this, but I'm not yet been sentenced to that. Um, portfolio is something I did while I was teaching from that curriculum at the high school where 
the students, I'll pass these around, the students were asked to, basically the assessment is the cover letter. I asked them to summarize the unit, the main ideas of the unit. And it was really good for, for students like this, for a student right here, who was one of these super motivated, super hard working students, but not necessarily a top mathematician in the class. So always, you know, a little bit below, even though she's putting in way more time than some of the other, because she, she enjoys learning, she enjoys mathematics, but she's not the top of the student. But it gives her time to go home and put everything together and show that she really learned stuff just because she can't show you faster than everyone else in the class. Some of the students hated it because they had to write all this stuff and they wanted me to just give them a test. But basically this counted as maybe there were three or four exams each quarter and this counted as one of the exams in the quarter. So you should just look at these and these are my students. Let's look at these and get some ideas. I, I really enjoyed doing this. I didn't, I didn't enjoy grading. Every alternative assessment comes the drawback more work for you. And, and of course, maybe, you probably know other classes, maybe Professor Truss has you do projects in some of the classes. Yes, yes. Projects is another type of a summative assessment that maybe you've been sentenced to in one of your own classes. So I think I'm going on to the last topic, and I'm not going to say much on design practices. If you have any questions, may I'll wait two minutes while you look at those, but if you have questions, I'll be in the if you have questions on anything else or anything else you wanted to say before I go on. Well, are these graded like based on completion? Or do you like actually go through and read? Yeah, by the way, I gave you some very good ones. Um, they were not graded on completion. The, the, the thing that's graded for points is they're, they're supposed to have the cover letter and give some of their old assignments and talk about some of their old assignments. But the actual grade was for was how well they wrote out the mathematics, how well they explained and articulated the mathematics in the lesson. And these are mostly A ones I handed out. I have some much lower grades up in my office, but so, those are for my teacher ed students to look through. <laughs> these are like not short, and you've like actually written comments. No, I read them all. I had I had five classes. I read them all, and I did it with I did it with my low level classes, which was a lot of work to, when I first got going to get them into it. Right. Um, by the way, I should add this in. It's, 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 it makes it easy to detect academic integrity issues. I mean, because I actually have students copy the portfolio of freshman students and I brought in a, some slides and I said, you know, here's here's one and here's one. Who should get the higher grade? It took the class 15 seconds to say they cheated. And so I didn't have to make any accusations. Um, yeah, they wrote a lot. This was a this was a this was a class. I have some uh, I had some from various levels of the class up there in my office. Like, I remember having a like a creative writing class where the teachers would read the lesson you did. Well, I read them. Oh, like the I read them. This is a very interesting. Okay. So there are grammar and notation. There are grammar and usage comments, but that's not part of the grade unless it detracts the tracks from the meaning. Um, the grade is actually for how we So this was, a, I think, this is, some of you are looking at a really nice trigger unit came from this interactive math project where the students took the problem home and solved it first and then we worked on it the next day in class. So you can just keep looking at them. I'm going to go on so you have other time at the end if you want to ask anything. Um, design practices is something that is really important and I think it's well done even less when someone starts teaching for the first time. It's thoughtful planning, not just of a new course you might be designing, but a thoughtful planning of a course just before you can teach it. When I was in grad school, a colleague and a friend of mine um, told me, I have all my lecture notes planned for the entire semester. And my first thought was like a total slacker because I don't have my lecture notes planned for the first week yet. Um, but it didn't take me more than you know a day to realize that that's not, I was not a slacker. Planning for the entire semester means you're planning to stand in front of the class and lecture. You're planning to not know who your students are or what kinds of questions they ask or what their mathematical background is. So thoughtful plan part of thoughtful planning means to have your students in mind. And every class I teach is, is different. And you, you have to have the, the standards you've been asked to teach in, in, mind, in mind. You have to have coverage in mind. but. You need to have more than just, I need to get to chapters one through five in the book, and here's my lecture notes for chapters one through five. Um, so just a little tiny bit of what they say in the MAA practices um, guide about design practices. To think about your students. 
not just the mathematics. I actually, I actually wrote this in my teaching statement. That, uh, in an honest statement, in my teaching statement, it's very difficult for me to prepare the first lesson for a class because I don't know my students. And when I'm planning a class, I'm thinking about them. I'm thinking about how the discussion is going to go. I'm thinking about the types of questions they're going to ask. So think about your students. Think about the physical environment. Some things are possible in some rooms that aren't possible in others. Some things that you, if you want to get students to work in groups in a class like this, you need to think about timing and that it's going to be loud and the students are moving desks around and you're not going to get through as much mathematics as you might want to get through. If you're teaching high school or even college, you want to plan about how you're going to direct the students to get in groups and get out of groups without wasting a lot of time. Um, think about designing homework. I do this very well some weeks and very poorly other weeks. But don't just don't just go. Here's the problems you need to do at the back of you know the end of the chapter. Think about what you want them to learn and how you want them to you know, go about learning. I think I should have one more thought on design practices. I picked so if you, the MAA practices guide talks about something called backward design. I picked this one because it's something that's that my students are, it's some terminology my students are supposed to know. So this is one type of planning that high school teachers are supposed to know about it. So it's one of the ones I picked to put up here. Um, and backward design means, well, you go backwards. You start by thinking more about what are the very biggest ideas I want the students to get out of the unit first. And then what are the smaller objectives? The university is now calling these student learning outcomes and they, they might be posted on some of their syllabi in this class. So they're supposed to be, you should have student learning outcomes on your results. Um, and then think about how you will assess these. It doesn't mean write all the exams ahead of time, but it thinks of, think about how students are going to show you that they learn thing A and thing B. How students are going to show you that they know how to use this theorem. What kind of examples should students be able to come up with on their own? Think about assessment. Um, and then plan your day-to-day -day teaching. So this is the backwards design piece. I think that's all I picked out of there. Here's some resources. If you're actually interested, again, math education is very broad. If you, if you actually have other interests, Journal for Research in Mathematics Education is, is, a, is, a, is a very technical in the field of mathematics education research journal. Problems Resources in Mathematics Undergraduate Studies is more a journal for people who have done something interesting in their class. And they, it's a referee journal, but people who want to write about the types of teaching that they're doing with undergraduates, for example. So this is, this is a little bit more rounded and interesting. And if you're interested in thinking more about teaching at, at the joint math meeting and at math fest, which is the meeting the MIA, there are teaching sessions, lots of them, and panel discussions, lots of them. So don't just go to see talk after talk about talk your favorite mathematics topic. You should go think about teaching lots of stuff. So I'm nervous and proud. If you have questions, I'm happy to talk more. Relax. So yeah, should go ahead. Um, so what are like some like the big problems in math education? Well, my opinion is, and not like issues, but like problems that people are trying to solve, like as, like a subject or within the subject. Well, if you say math education as a subject, well, well, a, a main a, one that the mathematics researchers think about that's also related to something I care about is what kind of mathematics is needed for teaching. So. Do our, our students who are planning to be high school teachers get an undergraduate mathematics major? Do they really need a math major to go teach high school algebra? And my answer is yes. But what do they need to get out of that math major? They should get something more. They should, they should get something. So, so, so you know, the, a huge question is what kind of mathematical knowledge do teachers need to actually be effective in the class? So we need to know mathematics. Um, they need to know how students think about math. Say, say a little bit more about this. In, in, in my, I mean, it's, it's very difficult in my class finding the, in my classes now, just personally finding the balance. Because I know, because I have taught high school, that knowing more mathematics makes me a better teacher, makes me enjoy my job more, and stick with it more. My students get frustrated when they're learning something that they feel has no connection with what they're actually going to be doing. So that, that's actually a big question, personally, and also for mathematics education researchers right now. There's a new Special, this was not planned, Special Interest Group of the Mathematical Association of America that's looking at mathematical knowledge for teaching. It's called the Sigma MKT, which I've been involved with, and we're getting a very slow start. But you could um, 
there, there will be some things going on just in that, that next process. Can I answer my version of your question? I mean, my problem with what, what I think are serious issues is that we have lots of teachers who are going through programs that are not mathematically rigorous, and they're not comfortable exploring math in the classroom, and they're not comfortable answering students' questions or figuring out students' questions. I, I had students come in, teachers come and interview for, for um, uh, I sound like losing my, I'm losing my uh, name of the program, a, a, a program for teachers that involves professional development and academics where they get paid an extra stipend, stipend to do additional professional development for four years. They get $15,000 a year for four years. It's very non-trivial. They had a very competitive process. I've had interviews where the teacher can't do anything beyond something procedural, and they're giving an example of this person that she couldn't explain why this bizarre procedure managed to, to factor a trinomial, and it was just so. I think there's a huge problem with the level of mathematics in the schools. I also think there's a, my, this is my second big issue is that teachers have to do a certain number of hours of professional development in order to stay certified to teach, and so every university, including ours, jumps on the bandwagon as I'm going to host this professional development, I'm going to host this professional development. And I get an email every day of a different professional development activity that a teacher could do. It's not, it's not cohesive. And I feel like a huge problem is that we're afraid to let, as a society, we're afraid to let teachers have the time and the resources to figure out how to become better teachers on their own with their own kids. So the Japanese uh, public education system in mathematics, the, the, the Japanese students of mathematics are doing much, much better than us. And they went through 50 years of doing what's called lesson study, where the teachers together spend weeks and weeks writing a single lesson, then they'll present it, and critique it, present it in someone else's class, critique it, present it in someone else's class, and critique it, and they, they did this for years and years and years, all based on the schools. We're afraid to do that. We need to have other people constantly telling teachers what to do, and they're jerking them in all different directions. So on the one hand, I think teachers need to know more mathematics, and we need to raise the standards for what teachers learn in schools. But on the other hand, we also, once they're there, we need to give them some academic freedom and some time and resources to become better teachers in their own schools, on their own. Right? That was the thing that's really important. Yeah, I mean, because, like, regarding that, I know I've heard that uh, many of the people writing about educational policy in general have like no idea what they're actually doing. Yeah. In, yeah. yeah, there's problems here. Uh, I, the video's running, so. Um. <laughs> I mean, we, we should turn it off. <laughs> 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 we can turn the mic off for a minute. The direction of TPA, yeah, yeah, I know. Maybe I can stop the mic. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have enough respect for the repression, and we're also not pulling teachers to high enough standards. It's interesting having taught in Arizona and in, in Long Island and interacting with teachers on Long Island. Arizona was much better in terms of creative curricula and engage, trying to, at least where I taught, trying to really engage the students in different ways, alternative modes of assessment. But on the other hand, New York has a much better history of actually saying, okay, but at the end of the day, you need to hit some particular standard. We have this reading exam year after year after year, and we have some sort of standard which Arizona's has gone through three or four attempts at state assessments since I was teaching. So, sorry, this is really what I would like to talk about. Yeah, it's the politics. Yeah, you were going to say something. Uh, I was just going to ask about what, what happens in teaching, teaching sessions. What happens what? Teaching sessions. Oh, lots of different, lots of different things. Um, people talk about different curriculum they're interested in trying, but people will talk about, there'll be a whole session on flipped classrooms, for example. And teachers from different institutions will talk about how their flipped classroom in, in calculus or in abstract algebra and what they did. There's a guy who used to be at Jim Say, who is now in Arizona, who is also a number theorist, who does a lot with inquiry-based learning. He's got a whole inquiry-based inquiry learning sort of group. And so they'll have sessions where lots of people are talking about their work in inquiry-based learning specifically. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting. I'm, I'm actually supposed to be on a panel at Math Fest, and it's, it's looking at it's looking at a specific curriculum. I know what it is. It's looking at, so there's a group of people who are looking at, for example, abstract algebra. Maybe some high school teachers are going to be in your abstract algebra class. How do you modify the class so that it's more relevant to high school teachers in a way that benefits everybody? So some people are going to be talking about that. Um, 
and I already have my opinion because that's probably good, but probably teachers need to be involved. And if you just give these teachers just these few blinks and you add these few extra blinks and abstract algebra while they're undergraduates, at the end of the day, when they're back in their schools and they have regions exam pressures, they're going to just get into the culture of the school. They're going to forget those two lessons in abstract algebra and they're just going to do the day to day that they're asked to do. So unless teachers on their own at their school sites are able to have time to explore mathematics and explore teaching, in the United States we're going to be not getting it. You're from Congar. Can you share anything about mathematics education in Congar? So the only thing I used to say to everyone I'm talking about teaching, that I was surprised that here the students are, at least many of them are very hard working. So I, I think it has to do with uh, like the mm, higher education is uh, mostly free in Hungary. And I think it has to do with that. Because in Hungary you have the good students and the bad students, more or less. And the good students are clever and hardworking and the bad students are, don't care about anything and, and they don't want to learn. And here even if many times you have a student who is very, very hardworking but not, not very talented. But still, they want to try, and they come to office hours, and they try really hard, and they learn word by word my homework solutions. They don't understand it, but they learn it from the beginning to the end. And I, I don't know if, like, it's, it's I, I, I cannot decide if it's good or bad, because it's good because they are hardworking, and, and they can show that, and they improve their grades to some extent. But do we really want to give good grades to people who don't really understand, just learn everything. I, I still don't know. <laughs> yeah, you just hit on another message. Thank you. I'm glad I asked that question. That's very nice. All right. So I'm around. And I'm around if you want to teach high school, for sure. If you want to talk about that. I also like mathematics, so I can talk to you about math. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I have a question about experiments and methods and like math education research. So, like, how do you, what's your dependent variable? Like, how do you measure sort of what you want to measure? Actually, a trend in many institutions, not all, but it seems like a majority of institutions are doing, they do sort of qualitative research. So we'll do in-depth interviews with students to try to understand how they, what they learned about uh, the concept. It's not quantitative, as you're thinking. So it's a question. Think about there's some studies done by some good people, that are respected studies that are looking at what mathematics teachers really need to know, and what kinds of professional developments are really useful. And I want to say that they're, they're doing some qualitative research, but I think some of the quantitative, some quantitative work that's being done is looking at student test scores in terms of if, you, if teachers engage in this kind of professional development, how are the students' test scores affected? Is in a, in a type of quantitative work. Right. And it hasn't been done. Yeah, but it's a lot of it is qualitative, which makes it a little. So in the qualitative sense, do they ask students in polls of the other course, or do they ask teachers? I think I think a lot of all of that. Um, but qualitative, I'm thinking of like an in-depth interview with a with a teacher. Like I might have lots of questions to find out how much you really understand about what a derivative really is. Do you just understand the definition? Do you just know how to take the derivative of a polynomial? Do you really understand understand the derivative as a limit, for example? So they'll have, and, and they'll, they'll look at the question and then they'll analyze the question to decide whether the, the teacher understands it. A lot of it's quality. I mean, I don't do math ed research. I had a, a doctoral student in math ed research, but it was only because we had a history together and we had a very, very similar interest, and his work was very quantitative. He looked at um, Regents exam scores and compared them across different, he was basically looking at economic issues and comparing Regents exam scores in the Bronx to other places in New York, and so it was just very quantitative. Talk with you about the political issues anytime. It's not running. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I guess we have no more questions, just like a round of applause. Also, uh, I think some of us are aware.